Good morning, Fellowship of the Rockies. How are you? Good. My name is Eli Finley, and I'm the youth pastor here at Fellowship. And I'm so excited to be here with you guys this weekend. Pastor Charlie is with his family. He's spending some good time with them, and we're excited that he is able to go and do that this weekend. But I've been the youth pastor here for a few months now, um, but I've been on staff here since September of 2018, actually as an intern. And then, but, but my connection with this church actually goes back a long, long time. I've been attending here for almost 10 years. So I'm a product of this youth ministry. I'm a product of, of this church. And I'm so excited to be able to share some of that with you this weekend. I grew up sitting right over here, third or fourth row on my left-hand side uh, with my mom because she had to sit at the front because she's really short. We didn't sit up there because we were cool. It was, it was out of necessity. She had to be able to see. And so that's why we sat towards the front. Um, and once again, I'm very honored to be sharing with all of you this weekend. When I got to have another honor earlier this December, Pastor Matt and I were honored to be able to create the staff awards this year for our church Christmas party. And so we got to, we got to make these awards, and we based them off of the Dundee Awards from The Office, the show The Office. And so if you've seen that show, you know these awards are more about who you are than what you do. And so it took us all of about maybe 0.5 seconds to decide what Charlie's award was going to be, what Pastor Charlie's award was going to be this year. So Matt and I gave him the We Get It, You're From Texas award. That's what we decided on. And I luckily, fortunately, still have a job, and I'm not going to waste my opportunity. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18 is where we're going to be this morning. And while you're turning there, clicking there, whatever it is you do, I want to explain something to you that I always do when I'm preaching with the youth group, and I do what's called a callback. So what I say is, if you're with me, say, I am, and they answer back, I am. And we're going to try that this morning. So if you're with me, say, I am. am. There we go. See, this is what I have to do to gain their attention. And it's better to use a callback instead of taking off my shoe and throwing it at the front row. Not particularly appropriate. They may not appreciate that. So I use a callback instead. And what I, what I normally have to do is about three or four times I have to use that in about a 15-minute sermon. So they're all over the place generally. But I'm, I'm realizing more and more that their attention is just very temporary. It's not set in stone. It's consistently back, back to their phones, back to other things. They're talking, all these good things because attention is just so temporary. And what I realize is what I'm actually asking for is their focus. What I'm actually asking for is for them to concentrate. You see, a central focus, a single focus, is a point of attention, attraction, and even action. It's much more permanent than attention is. And the more I learn this preaching and and speaking, the more I learn this in my walk with God. Am I simply giving him attention? Temporary moments, 10 minutes to start the day, 10 minutes to end the day, 20 to 30 seconds in my pre-lunch prayer, How much time am I really giving him? Or is God truly the focus of my life? Is he truly at the center of who I am? And so today I've named my sermon, Fix Your Focus. If you're with me, say, I am. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18 say this. Therefore, we do not give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary Light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Today I want to walk through three simple and practical principles on how we can fix our focus on Christ. And you see, we all start somewhere. We all start with something that we are focused on. We have something that that we get hung up on, things that bother us, things that we're consistently thinking about or acting on that, that are part of our thoughts every single day. And this is why that's important, because what you focus on becomes what you follow. You see, if you're focused on the wrong things, it can lead you in the wrong direction. Take New Year's resolutions, for example. This is what you're going to see over the next few months, especially as we come into this new year, into this new decade, if you can believe it, 2020, it's here. It's a couple days away. We're in that part of the year where I don't even know what the date is, so I was going to say an exact number of how far away it is, but I don't really know how many days away 2020 is, but it's really close. I know that for a fact. And so what you're going to see over the next few weeks is people uh, deciding what they want to change about themselves, deciding what they want to develop about themselves. And many will go on to make great changes, and, and many more will have that gym membership for about two months and then cut it off because it's expensive. 
But every year we make such a big deal of what we want to change and develop about ourselves. In other words, what will follow, what we're going to focus on. And, but the problem is like what I said earlier, it's when, it's when we follow the things that are seen, when we follow the things that are worldly, it takes us in the wrong direction. When our goals are simply what will make us happy, what will make our lives better, this can pull us away from what God is trying to lead us to. In order to place Jesus at the center of our lives, in order to fix our focus on him, we first have to change our ambition. And that's my first point for you today, is that we need to change our ambition. Let me illustrate it for you like this. Have any of you ever seen the Super Bowl? Comes around once a year, pretty big deal. Almost bigger than Christmas, I'd say. I think more people watch the Super Bowl than watch Christmas movies. There are 60 to 80 million people who watch the Super Bowl every single year. And we have plenty of TVs in America. It's, it's primarily watched here. And so what, what happens is these players, they're, they're at the pinnacle of what we understand is like a goal for your life. They're, they're winning a, a championship for their team and, and really for their whole state, whole city, wherever it is that team is from. They're representing them, and they're winning something that's, that's a really, really big deal. They're at the pinnacle of money and celebrity and fame and influence over the next generation. They're at the top of all these things. But what's the first thing they always say after the game? One of two things. They, they either say, I'm going to Disney World, so they can cut another check right after the game because they got paid to say that, or they say, I can't wait to win another one. Next year, we're coming back for the title. That's, those are the two pretty generic answers that you get, and why? Because they're at the top of everything you could have as an ambition or a goal, and it's still not enough. It's because the things here are temporary. When we chase feelings like that, it's never going to satisfy us. And that's why in verse 18, Paul says we can't focus on what is seen because it's temporary, because it's leaving, it's going away. And outside of God, we can't be satisfied. Outside of eternal things, we can't be satisfied. And so if your ambition is to make more money or to get another promotion or to find that next relationship that you think is going to satisfy you, then God can't be the center of your life. And if he has no time in your thoughts, then how could he be? You see, we're conditioned to replace God with other things in our lives. It's part of our sin nature. We replace his plan with our own ambitions. And I'd say especially in Western civilization where we can have anything, anything at the drop of a hat. You could order a coffee bean grinder from Nicaragua and in two days it will be on your doorstep. Amazon has really ruined us in a lot of ways because the whole 48-hour shipping thing, it's fantastic. I order things for the office all the time and it's here the next day sometimes. But with that comes the idea that, that moral thinking is really just what will make me happy. It's instant gratification, and that's what we've come to understand as morality. But, but let me ask you this. Are you still satisfied with the things that you wanted at 16 years old? Are you still satisfied with the things that you even wanted a year or maybe two years ago? We change. We're malleable. And, and if life revolves around the things that are seen, like in verse 18, then I promise you, you will never be satisfied or content because we're, we're with the wind. We come and go. We're not permanent. God is. The only permanent answer to the question, who am I and what's my purpose, is found in a relationship with God. Anything else will leave you wondering those questions over and over and over again in a cycle. If you're with me, say, I am. Paul loves to use this metaphor of a race for the Christian life. He uses it all throughout the New Testament. And my question is, if you don't know where the finish line is at, how are you going to run the race? If your ambitions are in the wrong spot, how are you going to run the race? You see, there's this episode of the greatest show on television, The Office, in which Michael Scott is trying to raise money for rabies research. Okay, There's already a cure for rabies research out there. Michael Scott is just trying to be a good man. He wants to raise money for a good cause, so that's what he decides the whole office is going to do with him. So he decides that everyone there is going to have to run a 5K, okay, 5,000 kilometers. It's a little bit of a run. I couldn't do it. He wants to be a good man and raise money, so that's what he has organized them to do. So he gets his proverbial right-hand man, Dwight Schrute, to go and lay out a path for this 5K. And so Dwight starts like right here. Okay, this is where the office building is at. This is where the parking lot is at. This is where they're going to start. This is where everybody's car is parked, which is kind of important. 
and he makes a path for the 5K, and he ends up right about here. And very quickly, this, this 5K has turned into a 10K because they got to get back eventually, right? So see, when, when the finish line is here, it doesn't matter how well you ran the race. It doesn't matter how well anyone runs the race in the episode because at the end of the day, they've made it to the wrong spot. So you see, it, you could run this life just fine. You could do exactly what you're supposed to do. But if your ambition is in the wrong place, then you've still missed the mark. You see, in order to put God at the center of our lives, our ambitions have to reflect what he is calling us to pursue. You see, there is so much scripture that gives us a guideline to what this is. The first one I want to read for you is the Great Commission. It's Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. And this is, this is like I said, it's the Great Commission. And so these are the last words that Jesus says to the disciples before he ascends it back into heaven. And it says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So you see, in this scripture, there, there's two things given right up front that we know can be a purpose for our lives. We see that we should be bringing people to the faith. We should be showing them who Jesus is, bringing them to the knowledge of God. And we should be encouraging those who already know him. So you, so you got two choices here, two things that, that you know if you're pursuing one of those two things, you know you're doing it right. You're no, you know you're chasing after the purpose of God. Now, I understand that not every decision we make on a daily basis is going to go in one of those two categories. You debating whether or not to shower before you go into work or wear a dirty shirt when you go into work, those things probably are not going to affect the kingdom of God. But that's why we have scripture like 1 Corinthians 10.31 that says we should do everything to glorify God. Paul says that phrase throughout the New Testament as well. He says, in everything you do, do for the glory of God. He says that in Colossians 3 as well. It's all over the place because everything we do should have an ambition of bringing glory to him. See, at the end of the day, it's not wrong to want successful ambitions or or to want to have a thriving business or to win the Little League World Series with your kids. That's not a bad thing. But if those ambitions are done not for the glory of God, then they're purposeless, they're meaningless, they mean nothing, and you can still miss the mark. Our ambitions should reflect God's plans for our lives. You see, now we know what, we, what we're aiming for. We know what our goals should be. We know what, we're, what direction we should head. What's next? If you're with me, say, I am. Amen. I'd like to introduce my second point to you by asking a simple question. Have you ever asked a middle school boy to go clean his room? I never have. I probably will eventually. So I'm getting a head start on this. But, but this is, let's, let me paint you the picture of this. This middle school boy has not cleaned his room in some time. And you give him the ultimatum. You say, you can't go over to your best friend's house until the room is cleaned. And he is visibly frustrated. And he starts saying things under his breath that he doesn't think you can hear, but you can obviously hear. You know he's talking back to you. And he runs back to his room. And you can hear him shuffling around in there. He's throwing clothes and stuffing them in places that he doesn't think you'll see, but you probably will. He picks up the other things that are on the floor, and he puts them three feet over in the floor of his closet, tries to close the door. It doesn't quite close. It's just too many things are put in there. And he is audibly, visibly frustrated. You can tell he is annoyed by having to do this. But you see, in his mind, he's doing exactly what he's told to do. He is doing exactly what mom or dad said that he needed to do. But if you've ever asked this question, you know the problem isn't what he's trying to do. It's his attitude about the whole situation. You see, I I don't know much about that. I only know what my mom told me that I did. So that's, that's just about all I know about that kind of a situation. But it's the same for us. In order to fix our focus on Christ, we not only have to change our ambition, but we also have to change our attitude. You see, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, it, said that, it says that for our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. You see, our attitude frames the way we see the world. And we can either see it like that verse says, like light and momentary, or we see it as heavy and permanent. And like things are just never going to end. Things are never going to change. 
your attitude frames the way that you see that. But you see, there are two sides of this concept of changing our attitude. The first is, is when our attitude in the faith is simply, woe is me. It's very selfish. It's very self-centered. And if that's the attitude that we take in the faith, then it doesn't matter what our ambition is. We're going about it in the wrong way. So when I was ring shopping for my wife, Grace, I bought her ring in March of 2018, and we got married this last August, so it all turned out okay. But let me tell you the story of how I purchased her ring. So I won't tell you the name of the company that I went to because I don't want to change your mind about them because I did not have a great experience with them because that's where we're going with this. I didn't have a great experience the first time I ring shopped. And so it's a large enough company that they had an app. They had a website that I was able to design the ring that I wanted for Grace on. So I went on there. I tried to add all the things that I could, but there were some things that I still wanted to do that I couldn't really do on the computer. So I had to go into the store, and I talked to this clerk, and, and she became annoyed pretty quickly with all the things that I wanted to do. And, and I was asking her to change this and add more diamonds because diamonds are a girl's best friend. And all of these things. There's more things that I want in there, and I want to change this part, and I don't want it to be shaped this way. I want it like this, and I want it to look good. And, and her answers are, you know, well, you know that's going to take longer, right? You know that's going to cost more money, right? And yes, I'm aware, but we're going to be married for the rest of my life, so it's kind of important. And so there are things that, that she says that just really makes me feel like a burden and makes me feel guilty for asking her to, you know, do her job. So we get to this point where I, I've got a couple more things that I want to ask her, but I just don't really feel comfortable asking her. So I decided to go to the other Jared Gallery of Jewelry in town because we had two of them, and I decided to go there instead. And so the people there, they helped me out just fine, and, and we got through all the things that I needed to get through, and, and they gave me a really good price on the ring, and it all ended up okay. Grace and I are married. We're happy. So, so it ended up okay. They took care of me. I got the ring. But you see, with that first person, she was accomplishing what I was asking her to do. She was able to do it. The problem wasn't her performance. The problem was her attitude about the whole thing, and it really just... It, it changed the way that I looked at the situation. It made me not want to be there. You see, in this life, you could be headed in the right direction, but if you do it with the wrong attitude, then it is purposeless. The Bible says that we could have faith to move mountains, but without love, we're nothing. If you're with me, say, I am. Amen. Philippians chapter 2 says that we should adopt the attitude of Christ. who was, He was humble and obedient to the point of a cross. You see, our attitude has to reflect the same as Jesus, humility and obedience and love for others to the point of even a cross. You see, the other side of this concept of changing our attitude is when life truly becomes difficult, when we really walk through things that are too much for us to handle alone. It's easy to read verse 17 and say, whoever this Paul guy is must have had a pretty easy life to be able to say it's light and momentary. You know, if Paul had had his parents divorce at age 12, he wouldn't say this life is light and momentary. If Paul could see what heart disease and cancer and dementia have done to my family, he wouldn't call it light and momentary. He doesn't understand. It's easy to see these verses and say that. But there's something that I want you to hear loud and clear today is that Paul's not writing this to downplay what we will go through as Christians. He's not writing this to, to downplay the difficulties that we're going to see in this life because we're going to see some things that it's going to take more than just us to get through. But because Paul's focus is on the unseen and not the seen, he knows the greatest afflictions we will go through here are nothing. They are nothing compared to what heaven and a healed relationship with God are. And you see, at this point in time, Paul has been through quite a lot. He's been through a lot of persecution that I doubt we in this church will ever see. He's been beaten and imprisoned and shipwrecked and bitten by snakes and stoned. And that means they threw rocks at him until they thought he was dead and dragged him outside the city until he would eventually die. That was their goal, was to kill him. So, so he's been persecuted in some pretty awful, awful ways, ways that we don't fully understand either. But you see, his attitude has changed. He knows that this life is not about him. You see, when our attitude reflects Christ in our lives, then the problems we walk through today, they change also. They become opportunities for us to either grow nearer to God ourselves or to share him with others as a testimony. 
because your trials become your testimony. The trials and the lessons that you learn today will become the things that you tell others tomorrow. Those are the things that you will show others and teach others to grow through. You see, the valley of the shadow of death is still just a valley. And if you keep walking, there will be a mountaintop. And going from a valley to a mountain, it's an uphill journey. It's an uphill battle most of the time. But with the perspective that God's unseen eternal prize is waiting for us, the mountain doesn't seem as steep. And the valley doesn't seem as deep. See, now we have two pieces of the puzzle. Our ambitions, we know they need to reflect God's plan. And our attitude, we know we need to adopt the same attitude of Jesus. The last thing that will have to change is our actions. They follow afterwards. You see, when we have fixed our focus on Christ, the Bible is clear. We've been crucified with him. The old has passed away. We are a new creation. We have to put to death the evils we once did. In other words, our actions have to change. You see, changing our focus takes sacrifice. Let me say it in a way that Jesus demonstrated for us. You can't have a resurrection without a crucifixion. There are things that you will have to die to in this life to put God at the center of it. There are things that you're going to have to sacrifice here that will allow you to focus on him. So one question I want to ask you guys today is is simply, what do I need less of to have more of God? You see, in, in Luke chapter 9, this, this is where Jesus calls his disciples and he calls us to pick up our cross and to follow him. You know, and I've had this verse on a coffee mug. I've seen it on bumper stickers. We use it today as comfort, but truly, when this was first preached to the disciples, it was a death sentence. He is calling them to the most ugly and gruesome death that they could understand at the time. He's saying, that's what you're going to have to go through to follow me. We sacrifice our plans for his. We sacrifice our desires for his. We sacrifice our comfort so that he can comfort us. Jesus also says that we cannot serve two masters and our actions have to reflect a relationship with him. That has ramifications. Not only does it mean that we, we battle against sin in our lives and, and we sacrifice things and we, and we stop doing things that we once did, It means that, but it also means that there are things that we now do because of the gospel. You see, this Christian life has to be more about what we do as Christians than what we don't do or don't like or or stay away from as Christians. It has to be more about what we do because of the gospel. It has to be more about the people that we reach, the people that we're able to be comfort to. It has to be more about that than what we've given up. Romans chapter 9 says, how can others hear the gospel if it isn't preached? And that's what I mean when we should do things as Christians. We need to share the gospel. And how can others hear if it's not preached? And this is not just for pastors. This is for everyone. So I guess by extension, it's also for pastors. But it's for everyone. It's a calling for everyone. You see, there's a common quote that many Christians know and memorize. And it was taught to me as a kid. And it it says, you should always be preaching the gospel. And sometimes use words. Now, I don't want to ruin your opinion of, of that of that saying, it's a tradition in the church, but it's not exactly biblically accurate. You see, I understand the concept that we should practice what we preach, that we should live out our faith. I understand that fully, and I think that's great. But the idea that your only responsibility as a Christian is to just take care of yourself and your own business, then you have missed the point of Jesus' teaching and the reason that he came for us. Other people cannot know Christ unless we actively talk about him. We must live out loud for him. And that's, that's how your faith grows too. It's not always about bringing people to the faith. I couldn't tell you how many people that I have attempted to share the greatest news that they could ever hear on this earth and they don't want to hear about it. That's okay. It built my faith. It challenged me to get out of my comfort zone. You see, there's this, there's this leader that leads in our youth ministry and his name is Will Bertina. And if you have had a conversation with Will Bertina, odds are he has tried to share the gospel with you whether you know it or not because that's what he is passionate about. Also, he is the most in shape 61-year-old man I've ever seen in my life. He can still like kick over the top of me and stuff. Whatever Tai Chi, Chai Chi stuff he does, I don't even know. What I do know is that he is in really great shape for an old man. And and because he's an old man, 
he loves to tell this joke. He loves to say, I do ministry with one foot in the grave. He loves telling that joke. And we always laugh. I think it's hilarious. But Will's got it just a little bit wrong. It's only half right. Because I see him do ministry with two feet in the grave every day. You see, Galatians 2.20 is his life verse, and it says, I've been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by the faith of Jesus. He lives that out every day. He dies to himself. He dies to the desires he once had so that he can live for Christ. His attitude has changed. His ambitions have changed, and his actions have followed. He is a gospel-sharing machine everyone he comes into contact with. And that's what I mean by an act of faith. That's what I mean by that, is that he's always, always talking about it. And you see, he's taken that to a new level in my life. He's made me understand that in a whole new and fresh way. It's not just about dying to old things and sacrificing the old things, but, but there's a gospel that he's taught me about that I can't stop talking about, and I, I won't stop talking about it. It's like John and Peter were, were arrested for the same gospel that I get to preach freely today. And their reaction was the same. They said, we can't stop. They told the people who arrested them, it doesn't matter what you do to us. We cannot stop telling others about Jesus and what he has done for us and for you. And we can't stop talking about it. Because though we try to fix our focus on Christ, he has already focused on you. The Bible says that, that we can only love because you first loved us. I want to read Isaiah chapter 49, uh, verses 14 through 16 for you. They say this. Zion says, the Lord has abandoned me. The Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child, or lack compassion for the child of her womb, even if these forget. Yet I will not forget you. And the Hebrew is stronger there than even we translated. God is saying, I cannot, I cannot forget you. Verse 16. Look, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. There's one other thing that I know went through the palms of his hands. They were nails. The moment Jesus walked into Jerusalem knowing he was going to be betrayed and he was going to be crucified, he knew exactly why he was doing it. And it's not just for the people in this room. It's for everyone. John 3.16 says he so loved the world, not just the people who go to church, not just the people who know him. He loved everyone. And he died for their sins, all of us. He focused himself on us. You see, when we put Christ at the center of our lives, it allows him to take control of our focus on what we follow. It allows him to fix our focus on his eternal weight of glory. And that's heaven and perfect, perfect relationship, not just with him, but with each other also. Bow your heads with me this morning.